Uh, thank you. Uh, before I, I get onto this, can I save a little time in hand? So I know that members were expecting in the open debate just three minute speeches, but I can be really generous and make them four minute speeches. Now, hasn't that made your day? I know every politician here can talk for an extra minute without any encouragement from me. So, <laughs> next item of business is a debate in motion 24247 in the name of Lewis MacDonald on what should primary care look like for the next generation. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons? And I call on Lewis MacDonald to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Health and Sport Committee. Convener, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I am indeed delighted to open this debate on the Health and Sports Committee. Uh, report what should primary care look like for the next generation. The title of this report is deliberately framed as a question and I want to start by thanking all of those who offered their answers from the point of view either of patients and the general public uh, or of the healthcare professions whose views we also sought. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all those who have supported me as convener of the committee over the last three years the clerking team, ably led by David Cullum, who, like me, has three more committee meetings to look forward to, and indeed one or two other members uh, in the chamber too. The researchers in SPICE and the press and public engagement teams, and other parliament staff, including, of course, the broadcast and IT teams, which have enabled us to continue to meet as a committee throughout the pandemic. Members of the committee, past and present, and those witnesses who have shared their expertise with us on a vast array of subjects. Today I also want to thank ministers for positive engagement in general and for a quick response to this report in particular. While there are many areas of agreement, there are other questions which will clearly be for the relevant committee in the next session of Parliament to pursue and for the Health Secretary in the next session of Parliament hopefully to deliver. And may I also uh, mention uh, Jean Freeman by name because of the work she has done with the committee over the time when I've been in the chair and is, that is appreciated. Our starting point for this report was to ask the public what kind of primary care service they wanted to see and then to ask the healthcare professions whether the public's vision could be realised and if so, how. We received over 2,500 responses to our public consultation. We ran a session with the Scottish Youth Parliament who also surveyed their members and we held detailed discussions with public panels over two weekends in Aberdeenshire, Lanarkshire and Fife. The public told us they wanted to be able to access primary care just as easily as they can access community pharmacy, with weekend opening and longer hours, and to be able to make appointments online. They were clear that patient data should belong to the patient and that new technology could help to improve patient care. COVID-19 delayed our report, but it also accelerated some of the changes which the public told us they wanted to see. The next challenge will be how to provide the personnel, the resources and the governance structures to embed those positive changes in the future delivery of primary care. Contrary perhaps to some interpretations, our report is supportive of GPs and seeks to make best use of their valuable time in seeing those in need of the skills which only they possess, while at the same time making best use of the skills of each of the other professions in the wider multidisciplinary team. There is broad consensus that primary care should be at the heart of the healthcare system, that care should be delivered by multidisciplinary teams, and that patients should be able to access the right professional at the right time to let them remain at or near home whenever possible. The challenge is how to turn that shared vision into reality. We believe there are key roles for health and social care partnerships, for multidisciplinary teams, including GPs, and for the public themselves. Health and social care partnerships as integration authorities are responsible for the whole range of primary and community health services, accounting for over a third of the total budget for health and social care, which in turn accounts for half of all expenditure by the Scottish Government. They themselves recognise <coughs> that primary care needs to change if it is to align with a community approach. Edinburgh City Health and Social Care Partnership told the committee primary care is not established to focus on the priorities of local communities. Its priority is the health needs of individuals. Partnerships themselves can help to change that through their strategic commissioning plans and the localities they have established. 
Primary care improvement plans should be in place very soon, and we may hear a little about that from the Cabinet Secretary, and they should reflect local needs and priorities. Our report highlights early evidence from partnerships of the benefits already gained from changes in how services are delivered, such as improved use of GP time because of patients accessing other members of the multidisciplinary team. GPs want, rightly, to remain at the heart of health care in the community. They do recognise the key role of other professions, from occupational therapists to district nurses. The change we need to see is for doctors and patients to reset expectations about who will help in what way, so that support and care from each member of the multidisciplinary team is seen as of equal value, where it is the care that the patient needs. National workforce planning must take account of a shift in the balance of care from hospitals to the community, and the committee is keen to see the principles of the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Act put into practice as soon as possible. The public told us they wanted to see a more preventative approach and more emphasis on social prescribing, and those aspirations are reflected in our report. So too are the views of all the healthcare professions and the general public that access to data within primary care must be improved, not least by having IT systems which talk to each other and which allow healthcare professionals to access information and allow patients to tell their story as few times as possible in order to receive the care that they need. The COVID pandemic, presiding officer, has been challenging for all involved in primary care as across health and care in general, but it can also be a starting point for the delivery of real and lasting change if we find ways to embed the improvements that have perforce been made in responding to this emergency over the last 12 months. I look forward to that uh, happening as we go forward, and I commend our report to the Chamber and move the motion in my name. Thank you very much, Mr Macdonald. And can I say I can be a little bit generous, obviously, to the open speakers and, and closing. don't want to feel, make you feel disadvantaged in any way. Um, and I call and Jean Freeman, Cabinet Secretary, to open for the Government, please. Th thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and thank you for your generosity. Um, in opening, can I uh, also start uh, by uh, welcoming this report? Uh, but before I go on to talk about that a bit more, can I also thank uh, the members of the Health and Sport Committee that I've had the privilege of working with, uh, including and in particular Mr Macdonald as the convener uh, and the other colleagues. I've, I've found our engagement very constructive uh, and very positive and helpful. Uh, and that takes me indeed to uh, this current report. Uh, it is a very helpful contribution uh, to our current work in reforming primary care. And I'm grateful to the committee, uh, not only for the contents of the report, but for the, the way in which it went about uh, gathering its evidence, taking evidence uh, not only from health professionals, but also the views of the public, especially the views of younger people who want to be engaged with the way services are delivered now and in the future, uh, and in many ways uh, want to be engaged in a different way from older generations. The committee raised a number of important questions and suggestions on how we continue to strengthen primary care, and I have now uh, formally responded to the report. Uh, much of what has been raised, of course, is uh, for the next uh, parliament, the next government, the next health secretary. Uh, but I hope, as uh, I say a few words now and in closing, uh, I'm able to uh, give the committee members assurance that their report is being taken very seriously and some of what uh, they are asking for uh, has already been gun begun and some of the thinking uh, certainly has already begun. Uh, before I turn to the report, can I uh, restate my thanks to all primary care staff for their work, particularly during the last year, uh, GPs and their practice teams, pharmacists, dentists, optometrists, allied health professionals have all responded tirelessly to the pandemic, continuing to provide essential services, but also adapting to new ways of working, some of which points to uh, new ways for the future, and most recently, of course, through their current and huge contribution to the vaccination programme. In many areas such as digital, urgent care and multidisciplinary team working, the response to the pandemic has both benefited from previous investment in primary care, but has also provided foundations for future reform. 
Uh, let me now touch on some of, some of the key findings from the Committee's report. Firstly, on the need to bolster and secure the role of multidisciplinary teams as part of a growing workforce in general practice. Since the landmark 2018 GP contract offer, we have invested £205 million in expanding and enhancing multidisciplinary teams across Scotland, with the number of GPs also increasing to 200, by 234 over that period. This significantly helps us to ensure that people can expect to see the right person at the right time, whether that be, for example, direct access to a pharmacist to manage medication or a physio for musculoskeletal issues, enabling GPs to spend more time with those individuals with complex care needs. And in the current work on the redesign of urgent care, we are seeing some of that uh, investment coming into uh, fruition, but also seeing really the real value of making sure that in trying to ensure we have the right care in the right place for individuals, uh, that primary care in its widest definition has an absolutely central role to play in that. I also acknowledge the importance of improving access to general practice. For many, it is the first and often only point of contact with the health service when issues arise, and it is really important we get that right. I've said before in other places, and I, I would say here today again, uh, for me, primary care in its widest definition is the foundation of our health service. It is where most of us will have most contact, and for some, it will be the only contact we have with our health service throughout our lives. It matters that we get that right, that it is accessible, and that it addresses the needs that we have. Uh, and in doing that, I want to also commend the work of our out-of-hours GPs, our paramedics, dentists, and other health professionals who provide urgent care services at evenings and weekends. The report highlights that the citizen's voice must be at the heart of shaping our reform programme, also a key theme identified in the recent independent review of adult social care. I completely agree with that, and indeed earlier today, this morning, uh, was party to a, large, uh, a discussion with uh, very senior members of the Health Directorate looking forward at how we continue to respond to the pandemic, but how we build on many of the lessons of that and some of those foundations. And central to that was how we ensure at every level of our development of health and social care services, we are able to uh, hear the citizen voice. Uh, in some ways, uh, we have lessons that we can draw on from elsewhere in government on how that has been done, uh, but it matters to me greatly that we embed that as, as we develop innovative ways uh, to hear what people are saying, to engage with them in the development of policy and in the reform of services that are so vital to their health and well-being. The report recognises the growing need for mental health support and the role of primary care in early identification and prevention, and we are committed to building further, further mental health capacity and capability through the GP contract offer. Uh, offer. Social, social prescribing is also fundamental in supporting people to address the wider challenges they are facing. That work was necessarily paused in response to the pandemic, but uh, I am happy to confirm uh, that it has been restarted and is being embedded into our thinking and that we're well on track to delivering our commitment for an additional 250 community links workers by the end of this parliament, which is but a few weeks away. Uh, the report also rightly identifies technology playing an increasing role in services in the future. And throughout our response to this pandemic, uh, we have seen uh, uh, major shifts in the use of uh, tele and video consultations, uh, where the, uh, the approach is the absolutely the right one, without uh, dropping the importance of face-to-face -face appointments where that is the right thing for the patient and also the right thing for the clinician. And despite my generosity, I must ask you to conclude. Finally, finally, uh, I'll turn briefly to data and general No, we practice. don't have we don't have time. I've given you an extra I'll pick two it up minutes. Later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I just want to be fair to people. So I now call on Donald Cameron to over the Conservatives. I'll be generous with you, Mr. Cameron, at the same tempo, if you don't mind. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I want to begin by placing on record my thanks to my colleagues on the Health and Sport Committee for their work in, in this report and to the committee clerks for their efforts in producing it. I also want to thank those who gave evidence. I feel that broadly speaking, 
we have a report that can set in motion a wider debate on how we deliver primary care services in the future. I've long been of the view that when we discuss the future delivery of health and social care in general, we shouldn't just look at the next five years, but rather the next 25 years. Those of us in this chamber need to ask ourselves how we would like to see such services delivered when we are older, and indeed what kind of NHS and social care service we want to leave for future generations. The committee report covers a broad range of issues, including the GMS contract, the future role of multidisciplinary teams, and the status and purpose of IJBs going forward, to name but a few. However, I want to focus on the recommendations for general practice. This is an issue that the Scottish Conservatives have long believed needs to be debated properly and fully by Parliament. Before delving into some of the more specific issues, can I thank our doctors, nurses, ancillary staff, office staff, and all who work in general practice for their efforts during the COVID-19 pandemic, and in particular for their role in the vaccination rollout. One of the more important aspects of the pandemic that we require to grapple with is its long-term impact on the health service. Does it mean, for instance, that we should pause or instead accelerate changes that are underway? In its response to the committee's report, the Royal College of GPs made a number of comments, including that it welcomes the focus on improving data sharing, sharing and technology within primary care, which will bring huge benefits for patients and increase efficiency within the NHS. Both the Royal College and the BMA welcome the recommendation that the Scottish Government should devise an information campaign to inform the public on what their primary care service will look like, what they can expect and when. And the Royal College stated that it would like to see the target of increasing the GP workforce by 800 by 2027 reached and see workforce numbers across the primary care multidisciplinary teams bolstered. I agree with that. And indeed, the Scottish Conservatives have been consistently calling for investment in additional GPs over the course of this Parliament in order to address this particular aspect of the broader workforce crisis we see in our NHS and social care services. And in particular, I note the committee's report when it comments that more innovative approaches were required to attract professionals to rural practices where it was more difficult to recruit. Representing the Highlands and Islands, that is a pertinent point for me given the very real difficulties of recruiting GPs in remote and island communities. In addition to the need to recruit more GPs, current data shows that the number of GPs aged over 60 and approaching retirement is at a 10-year high, with some 250 GPs over 60 years old in 2020, and the number of GP practices decreasing by 9% during the period from 2010 to 2020. Therefore, clear there are multiple challenges going forward that we need to address within general practice to ensure it's properly staffed and properly supported and can meet the demands of a growing and ageing population. Deputy Presiding Officer, to conclude, there is patently more that we need to discuss and debate going forward about the future delivery of primary care services. There is undoubtedly, I'm afraid, a workforce crisis facing general practice, as well as in other areas within our NHS. And it's also evident that existing ways of delivering primary care may not be financially sustainable. We need a primary care system that keeps pace with modern life, that embraces technology, and above all, is shaped around the needs of patients. And that is something the Scottish Conservatives will continue to focus on as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Cameron. I now call on Sarah Boyack to open for Labour. Ms Boyack, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to thank the Committee for their excellent report. I think it's timely as we reach the end of this parliamentary session and debate about what needs, next, what needs to happen next. I think that after 14 years of the SNP being in power, we've not seen the major changes in our NHS that Scottish Labour believes we need to see. Recruitment of staff, support for patients, a greater focus on delivering in our communities and investment in preventative health me measures are all vital. And if we see a reduction in the pressures on our acute emergency services, the issues raised in this report need to be addressed urgently. GP surgeries and primary care are fundamental to people's access to our NHS, so it's vital that capacity is provided when communities like Musselburgh expand. And I think the challenges posed by the Riverside Medical Practice make the case for community concerns being acted very early and not being left. 
and more work is required in GP services and community services in terms of recruitment, making services more accessible to people where they need them, when they need them, and ensuring that patients are supported by digital records and systems and robust data collections. Ensuring that services are more patient-focused really comes across strongly in the committee's report in terms of the consultation feedback they, re they received. And preventative health, which is critical in terms of access to services and reducing health inequalities, has to be part of that agenda. During the pandemic, the British Lung Foundation has raised the issue of support for people with asthma and respiratory conditions. And it is shocking that people from low-income households are less likely to have good health outcomes in managing their conditions. So Poorer health and shorter lives as a result of poverty comes across starkly in the evidence on health inequalities referred to in the report. And we must ensure that coming out of the pandemic, people who've had COVID, especially long COVID, need to get the support they need in their local community. And we need to think more, as the report says, about community health agendas and I think the report is strong on this. So addressing mental health pressures for all age groups, supporting people with learning difficulties and the families who've experienced isolation will be critical issues for our health and social care partnerships to make sure we get the support we need in our communities as people recover from COVID. Over the last few weeks, I've had constituents getting in touch regarding access to cancer testing and calling for increased, increased awareness in our communities. So, for example, in the last month, concerns about pancreatic cancer awareness, access to cervical tests for women, and then the links to ovarian cancer have been raised. So, early detection is critical, followed by treatment where it's needed for all types of cancer. So, the more people are made aware of the symptoms to look out for in the communities with better information, the better place they will be to seek help and, and get better health outcomes. I also want to thank the RNIB Scotland and Sight Loss Scotland for their, their briefings about the importance of ensuring access to more work on preventing sight loss. The issue came up very strongly in discussions we had following the Eye Pavilion debate a few weeks ago. And RNIB Scotland suggests a public awareness campaign to raise awareness of what people can do to support their own eye health and to get them to get their eyes tested. And that raises one of the issues in the report about the range of different services that need to be available in all of our local communities. So we really need a joined up approach, investing in preventative health, investing in support for people to ensure access to a range of local health services and community support and community prescribing are critical. And if done strategically, alongside measures to reduce pressures on families, address poor health, and give people the opportunity to eat healthy, have access to decent exercise opportunities. These should give people better life chances and reduce the likelihood, for example, of obesity-related diseases. Investment in preventative health will take pressure off our hospitals if it's followed through. It doesn't mean that we won't need hospitals that are accessible and are centres of excellence. So let me take the opportunity in closing to say if we are to deliver good quality sight loss services and preventative treatment, I believe we also need investment in the new eye pavilion for Edinburgh. And I hope the Scottish Government will listen to the cross-party calls and calls from clinicians and our constituents for reversal of their decision and to act on this. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Ms. Boyle. Open debate. I call Sandra White to be followed by Alec Rowley. Ms. White, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I, I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, quite a few people, actually, uh, the clerks of the committee who have obviously been mentioned previously, who really did work very hard uh, during this inquiry, and, and others, uh, you know, basically the committee have looked at as well. And my fellow uh, health committee members, regardless of any political party. I think we all worked very well together. Uh, we may have disagreed it in certain things, but we came to basically a conclusion, and I must thank every one of them from whatever party uh, they belong to also. Uh, I think it showed the grown-up people on that committee that could put forward, put aside certain issues and work for the benefit of the people in Scotland, particularly in the health committee as well. I also want to thank uh, members of the public who are very important and the stakeholders also who provided invaluable evidence and opinion on our panels. Uh, their input was very, very vital to this report. 
uh, as a member of the Health and Sports Committee, our remit was to look at the sustainability of the current primary care provision and what shape it should take for the next generation, how we provide care for an ageing and growing population and for those with complex medical conditions, as well as governance changes to name but a few, which were all within the responsibility of this inquiry. Now, it seems quite a while ago, but the inquiry first began back in 2019. And uh, it does seem um, almost a lifetime ago, given what we have all endured in recent times. And in that first phase, we did we held panels to gather information, primarily from the public. Uh, this was necessary and a vital step, as I've said previously, in understanding people's experience of primary care and allowed the members of the committee to focus on the needs of the users, to hear directly from them on the current delivery of services, whether or not this was working for them and what they thought future primary care services should should look like. Uh, I found this, and I think we all found in the committee, very, very interesting uh, listening to the public. And really, it wasn't rocket science. Basically, it was about people and how the health service should work for them and be under no illusion the people who attended these public sessions certainly told us how the health service should work for them. And I found it very, very interesting. The second part of the inquiry focused on what we have at present, including current Scottish Government policies, integration joint boards, the role of GPs, and other healthcare providers, as well as the multidisciplinary teams and third sector organisations. Uh, this was quite an undertaking, uh, particularly when all of these services more were under pressure due to obviously the pandemic. And it certainly gave us an insight into the demands of our primary care providers and the impact on users. And I do appreciate the feedback and response from the Cabinet Secretary to the conclusions of the report and acknowledge the substantial steps the Scottish Government have taken to date to reform or our reforming of primary care. The doubling of funding to primary care improvement fund, a revised GP contract, support for multidisciplinary teams will go some way. And I do acknowledge the support the Scottish Government has already provided as a direct result of the pandemic to primary care services. Uh, I think the Scottish Government's vision on realising a world-class public health service, our system, that delivers the right care in the right place at the right time to improve population health and address inequalities is something that we should be saying it's very, very good and I do support that. I believe the committee report should feed into and provide further insights into how this can be realised and I do have confidence uh, in this government and in the committee for delivering on their commitment. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you very much and I call Alec Rowley to be followed by David Torrance. Mr Rowley, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, the, one of the key recommendations within this report, and I should say I welcome the report, I uh, very much believe that we need to tackle this issue. This report comes at the end of a parliament, um, and hopefully this report will not end up like many others on the shelf, but it will be used to make progress. One of the key recommendations says a focus on prevention needs to be prioritised and mainstreamed across all areas of health services and indeed beyond. Excuse the ice cream van outside there, the now presiding officer. Mr. Torrance, I was looking you... round in an accusatory fashion at the members in the chamber, and it's outside your house. Outside my office, presiding officer. I would draw attention to the fact that back in 2011, the late Campbell Christie chaired a commission that looked at the future delivery of public services in Scotland, and. The key to the report, the key action that was required was to invest and to look much more at prevent, preventing uh, in terms of health, but right across public services and local government elsewhere. And sadly, that has not happened. So the, the fact that we now come to the end of this parliament in 2021 and we have a report coming forward saying a focus on prevention needs to be pri prioritised, I would suggest it should have been prioritised, and that is key if we're going to move forward. I also think that the health and social care partnerships, the IGBs, in their current form, lack certainly democratic accountability, but I actually think that they, they need to be reviewed and we need to look at how those, those can be structured and function better than they are currently. There's always been this, in terms of community care, 
this tug between between funding acute services and funding community care. I think it was Alec Neil in the Parliament last year made a speech on this, where he talked about the need to introduce bridging funding so that you could actually bridge the gap between uh, less money having to go into the acute services and more money going into primary care. That, again, has been a major failure and something that we have failed to do over the last number of years. Now, I want to pick up on the BMA and the Royal College of GPs, because they say it is clear that in Scotland there is not enough GPs. Um, they make the point that it should not be an either-or between investing and recruiting in GPs or focusing the delivery uh, on other uh, well staff workforce areas. It has to be both. And the fact that the 800, there has been a commitment to 800 GPs uh, by the government, perhaps in summing up the Cabinet Secretary, if we can advise on how, how that is progressing. But they also, uh, they also say that GPs, that factors such as rising patent, patient lists, an ageing population, and ever more long term conditions continue to pour pressure on GP services, on health centre services, increasing demands for GPs' time. Equally, GPs are facing restricted funding, premises that are not in keeping pace with new demands for care, and now working through the COVID pandemic. This leaves their GPs exhausted and facing burning out. Where I'm sitting today in Loch Gelly, there was a promise before the last election from many politicians that there would be a new health centre built here, because the one that is here is not fit for purpose. The same in the village that I come from, Kelte, needs a new health centre. So if you don't put the resources in and the facilities in at a community level, then you can't expect to get the results. So you know, this has been a, a brief time. I'm grateful for your extra time. You've given me, presiding officer. This needs to be a much bigger debate. This report does highlight some of the issues, but I really hope the next Parliament can get to grips with this issue, because it is key for the future of all our health services that we get community care right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Rowley. I now call David Torrance, last speaker in the open debate. Thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Health and Sport Committee, I would like to offer my thanks to the clerks and everyone who gave evidence to the committee as well as my fellow committee members for their hard work in contributing to the second phase of this inquiry. Recognising there has been multiple developments within primary care services in recent times, we agreed it was appropriate we should look at the provision of services and approaches. Therefore, our principal aim was to consider whether we were meeting current needs and how they should be provided in the future. It is clear that primary care requires a radical revision to ensure that everyone receives the primary care they want, need and require for the next generation and beyond. A focus on prevention needs to be prioritised and mainstreamed across all areas of the health service and indeed beyond. The inquiry was driven by a work in hearing from the public for primary care services they want, need and require. When we began this phase, the world was a very different place and the delivery of primary care has clearly been significantly affected by COVID-19, both negatively and constructively. The many challenges presented by the pandemic have advanced both positive and potentially sustainable changes in primary care. Across our society, the 95 workday is quickly becoming obsolete, largely thanks to technology. The current delivery methods and model of 95 primary care services, five days a week, is no different. It just isn't keeping pace with modern living. The necessity to find new ways of working has discovered many benefits, both for patients and practitioners. I recognise that there are many exciting opportunities that digital services can bring. It is vital these are embraced, including the continued provision of phone and video consultations where appropriate, as they offer greater patient choice, more flexible in their day-to-day -day lives, and a reduction in need to travel. There are many exciting opportunities that digital services can bring, and I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to improving IT and supporting the health boards in this transition. During our evidence session, the committee heard from panel members who recognised and stressed that primary care services did not operate in isolation from other local services and environments, and were keen to see a community-wide approach to wellbeing. A vision which is indeed shared by the Scottish Government as we look to a future where multidisciplinary teams work together to support people in the community and free up GPs to spend more time with patients in the specific needs of their expertise. The message that the delivery of healthcare is about seeing the right person in the right place at the right time is an important one. 
All professionals involved in patient care have a leadership role to play which require collaborative working with a wide variety of professionals involved in primary care and multidisciplinary teams. To this end, I was pleased to see a significant process has been made with a substantial increase in the workforce to develop multidisciplinary teams, with doubling of primary care improvement fund to recruit multidisciplinary teams from 55 million to 110, and a further increase in, to 155 million in 2021 to 22. In conclusion, President Officer, I welcome the recommendations in the second phase of this report, which I believe has highlighted how the lessons we have learned can be applied in the future to improve the delivery of our care and support systems in Scotland. We are all keen to get back to business as usual, but it is only by understanding how primary care has changed since lockdown and for whom that we can direct the focus and ensure, with greatest need, get great, the right help. I also welcome the Scottish Government's response to Phase 2 report and the continued focus on delivering a world-class public health system that delivers the right care in the right place at the right time to improve the population's health and address inequalities. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. Closing speeches. I call on David Stewart. Close for Labour. Mr Stewart, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And could I also say it's been a great honour serving on the Health and Sport Committee for the last few years. And again, I also want to thank all fellow members who are, I see several of them are here, the hardworking clerks in Spice and, of course, the Government Minister, uh, Jean Freeman, who also is, uh, I think, standing down at the next election. So thank uh, the Cabinet Secretary for her efforts uh, over the last uh, number of years. Uh, so I believe this has been a, an excellent uh, debate with thoughtful and insightful contributions from across the Chamber, not least from my Labour colleagues, both Sarah Boyack and Alec Rowley, and of course, convener uh, Lewis MacDonald, uh, who's chaired the committee in a very uh, helpful and admirable way. And as the Cabinet Secretary herself said, uh, that the report was a very helpful contribution, not just the content, but the way the committee went about gathering the information. I'll say a little bit about that uh, later. And that was comments, I think, also echoed by Donald Cameron, who focused on uh, general practice and talked about future workload crisis. And I think it was also very helpful contributions from uh, Sandra White and uh, from David Torrance. So as we've heard earlier, President Officer, of course, primary care is the first point of contact with healthcare services. The Cabinet Secretary said that herself. We really equate it on many occasions to general practice and all the excellent work that's been carried around there. But of course, if the global uh, pandemic has confirmed anything, if confirmation is necessary, it is that healthcare is a 360 degree package. It's about mental health care, it's about emergency, preventative care, long-term palliative and recovery work. And this all needs to knit together in a multidisciplinary basis to ensure healthy lives for the people in Scotland. One of the issues I've been concerned about in the committee for many years, President Officer, is the appalling health inequalities in Scotland, where, in simple terms, the poor die younger than the rich. It was something that really struck me when I was doing my members' debate a few weeks ago on the Jury Report, the 1912 inquiry into health services in the Highlands and Islands, which really touched on the appalling problem of health inequality in 1912 in the Highlands and Islands. So we may argue it's a different degree, but it still exists and we still need to tackle this. Certainly a job, I think, for the new government and the new parliament um, after election. And as we heard, the report this committee published in 2019 was predominantly focused on the experience and views of the members of the public, the service users of healthcare. And although I've been in lots of committees over my 14 years, it's probably the first time I've had such an innovative way of interacting with the public. I think it was in Vidruri, if I remember rightly, uh, looking at Lewis McDonald. Uh, we spent a, a very pleasurable day there talking to ordinary members of the public about what they want to see for health. And they were, we were really planning it like a first year uh, planning degree. Uh, and I thought that was extremely useful and the feedback um, we, uh, was uh, essentially extremely good. So I really hope that the new parliament committees look very carefully at this new structure. So again, across the board, there's been a resounding call for a more patient-centred approach as well increasing uh, increase in preventative well-being. Now, we also looked at technology, and a number of members have looked very uh, strongly at this issue. Obviously, representing the Highlands and Islands, it's been something I've been very concerned about for some time. And I would particularly refer members to the Fit Homes project, which many members will be aware of, which basically uh, adapt, the home adapts in line with the changing needs of the residents. And if members have uh, an opportunity, could I recommend they look at in the Invergordon Carmen Dynamics, who make uh, this fantastic project. 
So technology in healthcare has been seen as a key in the Highlands and Islands, uh, as the reality and preferality of many constituents often makes access to the right professional at the right time extremely uh, difficult. But clearly, as has been said by all speakers, COVID-19 has had a drastic in impact on our healthcare, and it was right, of course, that we uh, took stock and focused on the, the pandemic in front of us. But that, of course, has led to divorce. Yeah, I might have read to divorce, but it's led to resource the diversion, staff burnout. <laughs> Never a truer word, presiding officer, is said in jest. Um, but also, there needs to be a, a process of rebuilding and renewal. Um, but as we say, we can't just go back uh, to uh, normal business. But I'm conscious, um, presiding officer, of time. So I will just finally say that I know the government's responded to the report on the 1st of March. And as far as my quick reading goes, it looks like they have uh, responded positively to the recommendations. And I look forward to seeing the enactment of this great report. And as remember the words of Thomas uh, Jefferson Edison, who said, opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. So let's roll our sleeves and get to work, President Officer. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that wasn't a Freudian slip and all's well with Mrs Stewart. Um, I now call Brian Whittle to close the Conservatives, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I am delighted to be closing this crucial debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. And I do think such an important topic deserves more time than the short debate we're now having. Nonetheless, it's been a very good and consensual debate from across the chamber. And I would like to start by thanking all my, uh, my committee colleagues for the consensual way in which we've managed to work during this parliamentary term. And it has been an honour uh, to serve with you. Uh, now, I've long suggested that a change in the way in which we deliver health care uh, has to happen because the current trajectory is unsustainable. I think the increasing percentage of the Scottish budget allocated to health has to reach a ceiling at some point. And I think this is against a backdrop of Scotland's unwanted ill health tag, and we are the unhealthiest nation in Europe and the unhealthiest small country in the world. And I think the impact of this on the well-being and the people of Scotland, not to mention the Scottish economy, is significant. And if COVID has taught us nothing else, it is surely the impact that health has on the economy. Poor health has also specifically impacted the outcomes of a positive COVID-19 diagnosis, with obesity, diabetes, COPD and heart conditions present in an overwhelming number of the COVID deaths. So shifting investment further upstream, so to speak, towards a more preventative approach, I think is essential, essential to the sustainability of our health service and the committee report agrees. That need for a shift in primary care to focus more on the needs of local communities and less on ill health, a shift towards health closer to the community rather than secondary health care uh, system. To be fair, the, the Scottish Government has accepted this uh, uh, as the direction of travel it would like to follow. I think the issue is the practical steps that will be required to attain this ambition are yet to be put into play. If we look at the most basic need for our GPs, it has to be uh, uh, for our GPs to be as effective as they can and want to be, it is the need for time. Time to spend with patients to fully explore patient need and crucially a variety of treatment options available to the GP to treat the patient in the most appropriate way. To, to that end, I think the roles, roles of allied healthcare professionals and pharmacists and occupational therapists need to be integrated to a much greater extent into the GP's multidisciplinary teams. A simple example of this uh, would be the fact, uh, as was mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary, that a physiotherapist is more likely to be specifically qualified to deal with MSK conditions than a GP. And given that a fifth of all patients present with MSK conditions, it would seem logical that, uh, that if a GP has the ability to triage these cases directly to a physio within the practice, not only would the potential outcome for the patient improve, but the GP would save a significant amount of time which could spend with other patients. The same can be said of dieticians and opticians and mental health practitioners, of whom which will be increasingly needed post-COVID. Uh, and we need to have those alternatives to the overuse of medicating poor mental health. Continuity of care is a challenge for GPs, and the committee's report highlights that a better utilisation of other healthcare professionals, including AHPs, it, is, it, it considers increased continuity of care should be achievable. The report goes on to say that it is clear that uh, allied healthcare professionals and others play an invaluable role in enabling people to live an active life and encourage the Scottish Government to include the full range of staff involved in supporting healthcare when planning future workforce. 
The work of the third sector and others in supporting patients must be fully integrated and incorporated into local planning. And this includes a GP or HS, HCP's ability to utilise social prescribing, giving a patient the potential to be an active participant in solving their own health and wellbeing issues. And that effort must be made to make social prescribing accessible to all, including making better use of community facilities. The committee reiterate the recommendation made in the uh, December 2019 report, social prescribing is an investment, not a cost, and that ask of 5% uh, of, of the budget from an integrated authority should be allocated for social prescribing. I think Public Health Scotland has a significant role in working with GPs and other public agencies to encourage and enable this direction of travel. Uh, there is a clear and present danger to the third, third sector in the current crisis. Too many are in a financial corner. Uh, and, and may not be there when we, when we come out of the COVID pandemic, just when we need them the most. So I think I'll close, uh, Deputy President, over just to say that we all agree on the outcomes that we would like, uh, which I think is extremely positive. But so far, I think there has been little from the Scottish Government's response that suggests that the plans that can meet these crucial outcomes to deliver primary care, health care for the next generation are in place. And I look forward to seeing the response, hearing the response from the Cabinet Secretary. Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Whittle. I call on Jane Freeman to close for the Scottish Government. Ms Freeman, please. Thanks very much. I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint Mr Whittle in the, in the time available. I'm not able to go through all the plans, but I very happily uh, do that in a, uh, on another day. Let me start with uh, what I didn't say in the opening, and that is uh, on the question of data, which the committee rightly identifies as critical. Uh, I want to assure the committee that work is underway, uh, building on the progress made in response to the pandemic and in discussion with BMA and RCCP. Um, work is also underway at what more can be done to give the citizen access to their health data and health advice using some of the learning from building our own Test and Protect app. Uh, and that is actively uh, underway as we speak. And let me also confirm, uh, as the convener asked, that work has been restarted on the implementation of the Health and Care Staffing Act, a very important act. And of course, it comes into its own in terms of the uh, independent review of adult social care. Uh, the pandemic didn't start the reform of primary care. Primary care provided by GPs, dentists, pharmacists and optometrists and their teams have benefited from sustained and record investment under this government. And our, prim our primary care reform focuses on new models of care that put individuals at the centre of decision making. But the pandemic has certainly, whilst it's paused some work, uh, has accelerated other critical areas. The role of community pharmacy is, I would argue, much better understood and much better embedded now in primary care than it was pre-pandemic. The use of digital technology, uh, now widespread across primary care, but also now into secondary and acute, improving access for the citizen, but also uh, speedier care and more accessible care. Community pathways initially uh, stood up uh, to respond to COVID, but now a central element in the redesign of urgent care. And probably really importantly, increased partnership working between primary, secondary community and the third sector, uh, providing a foundation, for example, in patient-centred diagnosis and care, specifically of relevance to how we respond to issues around long COVID, where we have the primary care team as the central holder of uh, the care for the individual, but using digital technology, able to access uh, specialist peer-to-peer -peer support uh, in order to determine whether further test diagnosis and interventions are necessary. And lastly, the Centre for Sustainable Delivery uh, stood up during the pandemic response, uh, situated at Golden Jubilee, but with the very specific job as a standalone centre to get us past that thing that has bedeviled us for so long, where we have uh, examples of good practice and good delivery, but we do not see it rolled out across the country. A central part of the Centre for Sustainable Delivery is, for example, um, to I, I know this will be welcomed by Mr Whittle, where we have good examples of the use of social prescribing linked to primary care uh, to make sure that we can roll that out uh, across the country, as well as other innovations more in the acute setting. Uh, on the issue of workforce, it is, of course, central underpinning to any improvement in primary care. Uh, we have more GPs uh, in Scotland per head of population than elsewhere in the UK. We've increased the numbers of student nurses in training, with their fees paid, of course, and with the bursary. 
We have training 500 advanced nurse practitioners uh, by the end of this year, increasing pharmacists' training posts and increasing the number of paramedics, and on track uh, for those 800 additional GPs by 2027. However, what is critical is to not be thorough to uh, plans that were in place before, but to recognise that if we are going to improve primary care, we need to constantly review the skill mix that is needed and therefore the workforce planning that is right to deliver that. That is all currently part of our forward planning work. And I would hope, uh, presiding officer, before this session ends, I doubt that we will have time in this chamber, but I certainly intend uh, to write to all MSPs advising of, of the work that is underway in our forward planning for the rebuilding of our health and social care service. Let me conclude by again thanking the committee for what is a very helpful report. Let me assure them of this government's commitment to taking forward those recommendations within the overall planning for for that, as I repeat again, that foundation of our NHS service, our primary care. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Before I call on Emma Harper, I should warn members who are in the next debate that we're running slightly early, so this is a follow-on, so they should be getting themselves to the chamber. I call on Emma Harper to close for the committee. Deputy Convener, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In closing, on behalf of the committee, I will reflect on the comments made by members, and I note that our committee convener has steered the committee well and thank him for his contribution to Parliament over the last 22 years, and he has been a great support to me as deputy convener also. It is important to note that much of our work in relation to this primary care report, Phase 2, was carried out before the COVID pandemic, so this report has been significantly delayed as a consequence of COVID-19. And I thank all who contributed to the report, including my colleagues on the, on the Health and Sport Committee and the clerks as well. And many of the committee's recommendations in primary care structures, access and general practitioners and members of the multidisciplinary team has changed a lot due to the safer engagement practices required to reduce the risk of the virus spread. Um, Cabinet Secretary has already affirmed that around 90% of all health contacts take place in primary care. And so it is important that we look at primary care and how can we make sure that we have the best processes as we move forward. We know that primary care is provided by many professionals in the multidisciplinary team with GPs at the helm. From the outset, though, in our inquiry, we looked at the Scottish Government's vision for the future of primary care services, which state that people who need care will be more informed and empowered and they will access the right professional at the right time and will remain at or near home wherever possible. And finally, and the, the multidisciplinary teams will deliver care in our communities and be involved in the strategic planning of our services. The committee endorse and share the view and have throughout this inquiry and our report made a number of recommendations which will hopefully inform and assist the government in its implementation. President officer, the need for change within social care is compelling, as demands and costs are predicted to grow sharply. And we debated aspects of the independent review of adult social care, uh, that report led by Derek Feely, last week um, in Parliament. And Scotland's older population is living longer, and folks have many co complex health issues and multiple comorbidities. And we know that the overall health and social care budget in Scotland in 2020 exceeded £15 billion and for the first time was 50 per cent of the entire Scottish budget. So the committee and our witnesses they were clear and agree with the government that this trajectory for increased resources can't continue indefinitely. And Mr Whistle has also raised the financial sustainability in his closing remarks. To this end, our evidence indicated that primary care should take on a more patient-centred approach, having more flexible appointment systems. That was one example that was cited. And I'm very aware that our GPs do spend long hours in their practices already. And David Torrance spoke about the modern life of nine to five. And locally, 
uh, in Dumfries and Galloway, I checked with a few of our practices, and I know that our practices are already offering appointments either side of the nine to five um, schedule with evening consultation hours already adopted. The flexible appointment schedule times were implemented pre-pandemic or pre-lockdown in many instances, and that is really good to see. We have also heard how a current heavy reliance on, on, on paper as opposed to IT systems was causing much frustration in primary care, and many IT systems do not talk to each other. Easy and accessible signposting about other services that might be available, as opposed to always having to visit their GP, was also suggested. I support the responses from the Scottish Government that our report recognises, or the, that the government recognises the value of social prescribing, and that the government has established a working group to help address this. And throughout this pandemic, we've heard how important the third sector is to health and well-being and helping support physical and mental health. The Cabinet Secretary has covered some of the key findings, including community pharmacists, the £205 million for expanding and enhancing the multidisciplinary teams, and changes to urgent care. The right care in the right place at the right time is a commitment from the government, and that the further support for mental health and work on data improvements was also supported by the Cabinet Secretary. Donald Cameron focused on specific GP issues and the challenge of general practice recruitment. And Sarah Boyack mentioned the challenges for people with poor lung health, asthma and long COVID, which we heard from in the briefing submitted by BLF and Asthma UK. And we also have heard from Alec Rowley, who spoke about the balance of funding between acute and primary care and the bridging funding that uh, was talked about. And I know Alec Neil has talked about pump priming in previous debates. Addressing health inequalities, obesity has also been mentioned by other colleagues, including Brian Whittle in his closing. And the Cabinet Secretary did cover much work that is already underway and workforce planning. And my colleagues Sandra White and David Stewart talked about the specific public engagement sessions that were involved in our informing our report. Presiding officer, I'm not sure of the time, but I'm happy to conclude. That's, that's that a good idea. Year, that's a good idea. Okay. Got there before me. Last, okay, last year was an incredible year, and this year starts with a further engagement and tackling the pandemic. So I look forward to the future, and I thank everybody that's contributed to helping support everyone through this pandemic so far. Thank you very much, Ms. Harper. And that concludes the debate on what should primary care look like in the next for the next generation. And it's time to move on to the next item of business, but there'll be a short pause.